one. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Gudis Barkan. I'm the president of the American Society of Cytopathology, and, and I'd like to welcome you to one of our Wednesday webinars. Uh, today, the webinar is brought to us by our one and only clinical practice committee, who is chaired uh, by Dr. Chris Vandenbush, who is an associate professor and an associate director at Johns Hopkins University uh, of the cytology uh, section. And I'm so excited to hear about the uh, walk around the block and the tale of multiple stories. So take it away, Dr. Vandenbush. Uh, thanks, Galiz. We have some wonderful expert speakers here, some of which um, I was able to, we were able to get from outside the committee to, to speak as well. So I'm really excited about this. Um, so Donna Russell will be um, will be overseeing the panel. Um, so thank you very much, Donna, for agreeing to that. Donna Russell is the education coordinator um, of the Cytopathology Resident and Fellow Training Program at the University of Rochester, where she's been for over 30 years. And she's also the program director of the Roswell Park Comprehensive Cancer Center um, College School of Cytotechnology. Um, there will be three speakers talking about how cell block preparations at their different institutions. The first is um, Melissa Randolph. Um, she is the site, um, cyto, she's the manager of cytopathology at one of the largest hospital systems in Indiana, the IU Health System, um, and she, where she has active oversight of five regional campuses as well as the Academic Health Center. And she'll be speaking about the cell gel technique. Um, then Dawn Underwood um, will be speaking about the salient um, automated cell block system. Um, she has been an employee of the Cleveland Clinic for over 24 years and is currently the manager of cytopathology there. And finally, we'll have um, Dr. Poonam Voira um, talking about the colloidin bag as well as the agar gel technique. She's an associate professor of the Department of Pathology at the University of California, San Francisco, um, and the director of cytopathology and the site director for the UCSF Cytopathology Fellowship Program at Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital. Um, so with that, without further ado, I will turn it over to Donna. Thank you so much to our speakers. Good afternoon, everyone. Make sure you can see my screen. Yes, we can see your screen. So our um, talk today is a trip around the block, a look into cell block preparations at three different institutions. And I would like to uh, welcome everyone and thank the ASC, Dr. Barkin and Dr. Vandebush for this opportunity to speak this afternoon. I will be providing a quick overview on cell block preparation. So the cell block was introduced in the late 1800s using colloidian embedding media, and this is one of the uh, topics for today. They are, they have, um, they, the cell blocks today have many advantages and they play a pivotal, pivotal role in cytopathology. There are some drawbacks as there can be some inconsistent cellularity. However, if you ask for dedicated uh, passes for cell blocks, uh, it provides the opportunity for one to really get a good quality cell block. Cell block preparations have been uh, present, you know, since the 1800s, late 1800s, and, and still use the same um, techniques today for preparation. They vary among laboratories throughout the world, uh, as we did an international survey. Uh, looking at cell block cytology throughout the world. And one of the benefits of cell blocks is it, it preserves the cell uh, for future studies. The application can be performed on any cytology sample. It's most commonly performed on FNAs, serous diffusions, uh, washings of any type, including pelvic and abdominal washings, or can be in, uh, done on bronchial brush samples, bronchial lavages, as well as bronchial wash samples, and any liquid-based samples. So don't forget those liquid-based samples. The residual uh, liquid that's left in those vials can be spun down and, and made into a cell block. 
Processing of cell blocks is not standardized across laboratories uh, in the United States. Uh, as we will hear from the University of Indiana University Health, the Cleveland Clinic, and the University of California, San Francisco today. The cell gel, cellient, agar, and colloidian cell block techniques will be presented in detail from our panel of experts. There are disadvantages and advantages uh, for cell block preparation, and this is just a chart showing some of those uh, advantages and disadvantages. Some are simple techniques that are very inexpensive, and some are very time consuming. Um, if you have a laboratory where you prepare uh, 25 or more blocks in a given day, uh, you're probably looking for those that are not as time consuming. So it's important, I think, for your laboratory to find the best fit and one that will uh, provide the best, best patient care for you. I'm going to just quickly go through some of the techniques. Um, the uh, plasma thrombin technique is very similar to the agar and gel technique. Um, plasma is added to the uh, suspended uh, supernatant um, and uh, then uh, it clots and we can make that into a cell block uh, preparation which is then processed uh, by, room, by routine histology methods. And as I said, agar or gel techniques are very similar where you add uh, a few drops of the molten um, gel and then the cell block pellet is formed and processed into paraffin. The colloidian bag technique, um, I'm just going to say a few words about that because we're going to have that uh, in detail later. Uh, it concentrates the sediment and it's supported in the agar or gel medium. And then again, the cell pellets then processed in paraffin. There's the tissue clot technique, which I think is really uh, a great technique when you're on those bloody FNAs and uh, it can really um, consolidate the tumor cells into that clot, which can be then transfer, transferred uh, directly once clotted right into the formalin uh, preservative. Selling automated cell block preparations are an automated technique that can be performed on a liquid-based uh, vial sample. And uh, the last is a sedimentation cell block technique. This is the one that we use uh, because we're one of those laboratories that performs over 25 uh, plus cell blocks on a given day. And uh, so we're looking for the simplest and, and the least expensive method. And we just uh, spin the material down and form a clot. Uh, we do re-spin and formalin if, if the material has not hardened. Um, we let it sit for 30 to 60 minutes. And then um, the cell button is placed into tissue paper and, and processed into formalin and the cell blocks are cut. So I just want to show you a few examples of uh, some of our, our uh, cell block techniques. This was a GIST um, a gastrointestinal stromal tumor from a gastric mass where our Diffquick and Pepinicola stain showed spindle, cell, uh, spindle cells on them. We got a great cell block preparation and performed CKIT and DOG1, which were positive. Um, SMA was negative. So this was a gastrointestinal stromal tumor. And this is important because of Gleevec immunotherapy uh, for these patients. Here's a squamous cell um, where on Pepinicolau stain, uh, you can see these uh, tumor cells. We got a really great cell block with a sheet of uh, cells here, which stained with a double stain, uh, double marker P63 and cytokeratin 5-6 and was negative for the napsin A TTF1 marker. This patient also had positivity for PDL1. Um, so this patient was then able to go on and, and get immunotherapy. Uh, the next example is just a lymph node from, abdominal, from the abdominum. And it showed metastatic renal cell carcinoma. We know, knew that the patient had a history of renal cell carcinoma and saw these um, number of uh, groups of cells with foamy, frothy cytoplasm and round nuclei with prominent nucleoli. Um, the cell block showing those cleared out cells. We did a PAC state immunostain on this, um, which was positive as well as the CD10 immunostain, uh, proving that this was indeed a metastatic 
uh, renal cell carcinoma. The bronchoalveolar lavage uh, sample here, we actually did an immediate assessment up in pulmonary in the lymph nodes, uh, lymph nodes and we did a bronchial brush sample that we performed an immediate assessment on, which showed, you know, some rare, maybe fungal um, organisms in the background, but it wasn't until we saw the lavage where we could really appreciate these um, septate uh, hyphae uh, organisms here. And on cell block, I don't know if you can see it, but there's actually a, a fruiting uh, head here uh, with these fungal organisms. So we stained it with PAS uh, histochemical stain as well as a, a GMS stain on the cell block where you can see the nice of fruiting body um, here and found that this was indeed an aspergillus infection. And lastly, I just want to just uh, remind everyone that we can perform cell blocks off of liquid-based samples. Um, and sometimes they're very helpful in, in, you know, pushing us to that edge of that squamous cell uh, carcinoma in, in PEP test, but they could be used um, on liquid base for any body site, but especially for squamous lesions as well as glandular lesions uh, in GYN samples. So I'd like to thank everyone and welcome, have everybody have a great spring. And I'd like to now introduce um, Melissa Randolph, who will be talking about her cell gel technique. Sorry guys, I'm having a little bit of trouble here. Okay, hopefully you are all seeing this okay. Melissa, we can see your control panel. If you can just click that little orange arrow. Got it. On the control panel. Thank you. Sure. I can give a presentation mode. I'm trying here. Okay, so our technique at our laboratory is called the cell gel technique. And I'm sorry, uh, for our particular technique, um, we had to experience um, failures before we got to a point of finding something that really was going to work for our lab. Um, prior to coming up with what we use today, we actually used expired blood bank plasma and thrombin. And we had used that for a number of years uh, with variable success. Uh, I can't remember what year it was, but um, we eventually started having trouble obtaining thrombin through some kind of a national supply sh shortage. So that combined with realizing that we don't always know the clotting factors that we were dealing with uh, with our expired blood bank plasma led us to start looking at some other methods. We also had to face some um, hard truths in realizing that our cell block failures were really contributing to a lot of, um, I, I guess, worry and um, trust issues with our lab because we were looking at about a 24% failure rate. So we defined our failure rate as the inability to view architecture, provide IHC classification or molecular testing, which was really um, burgeoning at that time. And we were on the verge of losing our service in favor of core biopsy. So we really had to act. So uh, there's our Debbie Downer moment um, where we realized that uh, we had no choice but to fix it. So what we did is we thought about, you know, what is our current state and what could we possibly change in order to make our cell box better? Um, our current state was our size of our collection tubes were variable. We would use 15 mil tubes with RPMI in them. And then we would also send 50 mil tubes to our FNA rapid assessments with about 30 mils of RPMI in those. Um, we did not do any fixation at the time of procurement. We used RPMI universally uh, at the time and um, had been kind of going along that way for a while. 
um, our, the composition of our collection tubes also varied. Uh, our 15 mil tubes were made with polystyrene and our 50 mil tubes were made with polypropylene. And we noticed that there was a sticking factor that was occurring in those tubes. So that was something that we wanted to think about. Uh, as I mentioned before, we didn't really know how effective our blood bank plasma was because sometimes we were dealing with plasma of patients that didn't have good clotting factors. So that obviously was shooting us in the foot. Um, and then the, also the idea of how do you wrap the specimen or how do you secure the clotted specimen within the tissue cassette? Uh, some of that was uh, quite variable. So what we decided to change, we came in one day and we had a meeting and we just overhauled everything. Um, we made all of our tubes a standard 50 mil tube with polypropylene to try to get rid of that sticking factor. We changed our fixative to BD Cyto Rich Red, and there was a, a reason for that. We had experimented with that in the past, and we noticed how much better the clotting was compared to the RPMI. Cyto Rich Red in its formulation is actually designed to um, aggregate small tissue fragments as well as hemolyzed blood and solubilized protein. So these were all good choices for cell blocks. So we did get rid of the RPMI collection for our cell blocks. We began using histogel at the suggestion of a histotech um, and said she had used that in another lab. So we followed the formulations and the package inserts and we used their cooling blocks uh, where everything comes out in a conical shape. Um, what we didn't like though is despite figuring out that we could do a butterfly technique where you literally are cutting the specimen in half in the cone, we still had really inconsistent um, sections for our cell blocks. So uh, we knew we weren't there yet. We still had an inconsistent product. So we went through some more iterations and tried to figure out what are our, our gaps still uh, and why are we not consistent and how do we make this an easier process? So what we thought about is we need more of a standard depth of a cell block. And we postulated the idea of using um, uh, reusable molds at the time, the metal molds, and we had to start somewhere. So that's where we started. We thought about the idea that it's hard for a histotex to understand how far to cut into a block and that there's um, a little bit of fear in that regard with cutting through tissue. So we wanted to think about how do we put the tissue in the block and have the least amount of facing off needed in the histology lab? We also had never really considered that embedding could play a factor in this. And so we wanted to come up with a process where the embedding was standard from block to block to block. Uh, and then our final thought was that we need to talk to people about how do we actually section a block? How do we do it optimally? Um, but what clues can we use to try to make it easier on them? So with what I mentioned before, with using the cider rich red, we had to address the idea that we are not using formalin fixation and we would need to make sure that we did a formal validation for that. Uh, so we did, and what we undertook was a uniform standardized and reliable technique that really, really cut our cell block failures to around five or 6%. So this is a high level overview of cell gel. And what I wanna talk to you about is how we actually collect specimens on our FNAs so that it's very uniform the way it comes into the lab and it really kind of saves the lab some processing time. So whenever we prepare our collection tubes for our needle rinses or our directed passes, we send each cytotech out with 30 mils of cytorich red in a 50 mil conical tube. So every specimen that's coming back to the lab is already fixed and it's already an equal volume. So that has actually helped us quite a bit in terms of our processing time. Um, the next step is just preparing um, a centrifuge and centrifuging the spe specimen at 1800 RPM for 10 minutes, which is our typical centrifugation time in cytopathology. And then we get this nice button at the bottom of our tube. We do need to decant the specimen, which is typical in fluid processing. And then we have this residual button here um, at the bottom. And you will notice because we use cider rich red that we really lysed a lot of that blood. If you really had a bloody specimen and you wanted to give this another go, you might be able to make that buffy coat, um, that sediment even a little bit lighter in color. But you can see this was a bloodier specimen that I'm trying to demonstrate with here. 
After you get the pellet, we actually want to re-homogenize the specimen using a quick vortex step. And you can see where it spreads it out a little bit in the tube again, but you're able to capture it with the next step. So first of all, you have to transfer the specimen into a disposable base mold. And specimens are still a little bit variable despite taking these um, precautions and these steps. Sometimes you have something that's kind of chunky and is going to leave a little bit of um, material behind in the conical tube. And sometimes your specimen is nice and fluid and it's really easy to, to suck up into a pipette. And so there is a little bit of variability there in how you can treat the specimens. Um, but one of the keys is actually trying to find something that's going to contain your cell block. And this is a little bit different than any kind of uh, tissue paper or any wrapping method. Using this mold is really good and consistent. The image on the right is on the top is a seven by seven millimeter square and on the bottom is a 15 by 15. And at the time when we started this technique, those were the only two sizes we had. We have since found a 10 by 10 that just seems to be the sweet spot for everything. Um, our FNAs typically go in the bottom mold and produce very nice cellularity there. If you have a fluid and you have not a great sediment, then we would typically use the top mold and we would maybe use two, three, four in the same cassette so that we're really concentrating in that surface area, but we're trying to make sure we use all the sediment that we get out of the centrifugation step. So once we transfer the specimen to the tube, we then have the histogel coming into play. And histogel can be a little bit finicky, although I think we found a really good way of dealing with it. Um, we did buy the um, heater block that they try to supply with your startup kit. And we leave the histogel going all, all morning, really, um, until we start getting our specimens in from the hospitals. And we'll just stir it every once in a while and get it to that molten state. And then it will just stay that way throughout the day. Um, I do believe that there is an upper end of the histogel, so you don't want to take it over, it's either 60 or 65 degrees Celsius. So that's one thing where you can actually heat it up where it does not work as well for you. Um, and because we're a lab that produces 25, 30 cell blocks a day, we, we can do this without a lot of waste. It, uh, it's about two tubes a day is what we would go through. So once the histogel is prepared, you can add it to the disposable base mold, and that is on top of your specimen that you've already transferred. So what you have after that is, this is an example of what it looks like after you have the specimen and the histogel in there, the third picture. And then the fourth picture, we found uh, just a really good way of solidifying it and doing it quickly is to do a floating water slash ice bath. And with this method, you can have solidification within 30 seconds if you have a suitable specimen. Formalin will take a little bit longer. We really don't have as much luck with formalin clotting as we do with the cytorich red. So if for some reason you go to check it and it hasn't solidified, all you have to do is put it back on the ice bath. Finally, we prepare a cassette with a pre-cut foam, and that foam is really helping us capture to make sure we don't have anything floating in our tissue processor. Um, this, these particular, um, the addition of this step really helps us feel as if we're not going to have that. Uh, you remove then the solidified sample with, we have this handy dandy metal spatula that we had gotten sometime from the chemistry department, and it's, uh, it's our go-to. So we just lift this, the um, cell gel out of the mold and we place it in the cassette exactly in the same orientation that we get it out of the mold. The reason for that is because when the histotechs continue with embedding and then later sectioning, the heaviest material, the most cellular material is coming in contact with their blade first. We have definitely found when we expect to have a very cellular cell block and that we're not getting much, likely the specimen has been flipped and it's a very easy process to melt it down and, and fix that. So this is an example of 
just a few of our cell blocks from just a, a random day um, where you can see that we are able to come up with a nice cellular specimen. Uh, the architecture is well preserved. Um, and I hope to be able to show this in the next screen. Um, you know, you can come up with things where you've got the smaller aggregates, you can have your single cells, you can have uh, clots and then your tumor uh, percol percolating throughout. This bottom left-hand corner is more an example of what a fluid um, malignancy would look like in the cell block. And then you do have some background uh, cellularity that you have to contend with. Um, and then on the right is just kind of what this looks like after processing in the processor and being sectioned. So obviously one thing that you have to consider whenever you're changing your fixation is what is this going to do to my immunostaining or any other downstream testing. And we were really pleasantly surprised with how our immunostains were turning out. Unlike one of the slides that Donna was talking about with the plasma and thrombin, we had always observed a tremendous amount of background staining with that technique. With the cytorich red and the way that the specimens are lysed, the background is really, really clean. And so we're, we're pretty happy with that and how you can um, see the membranous staining um, a, a little, you know, pretty easy. Uh, this is an example of a tall cell um, thyroid carcinoma that had been metastatic and we performed a thyroglobulin, a nice PAX-8 with good nuclear staining, a TTF-1 with beautiful nuclear staining, and then a keratin. And you can see there's a little bit of background staining in what would be some of those um, blood clots, but still nice and specific to the cells in question. So that is the method that really works for IU Health. And we've now been performing this for almost six years. We really have had little variation in this method and we're kind of to the point where I don't know what we would do to modify it to make it any better. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions anybody has. Either you can email me or ask the panelists. And with that, I'd like to pass it on to Don Underwood. Thank you, Melissa. Okay, hopefully everyone can uh, see my screen now. Um, thank you to the ASC Clinical Practice Committee for inviting me to speak to you today regarding our cell block methodology at Cleveland Clinic. I'm gonna review the cellient cell block system as how we implemented it in our laboratory and why it turned out to be the best cell block um, for our laboratory. Currently at Cleveland Clinic, about 95% of our cell blocks are made on the Salient system. We have five instruments at our main campus and two regional sites each have one instrument. Blocks are thrombin clots because we need those ones to be formal and fixed. We have a very similar story to what Melissa told. Uh, we, I, I consider it a perfect storm, uh, kind of in early 2009. Our non-gen volume was in, rapidly increasing. We were adding prep personnel. We had to add a second shift for processing samples. We were performing rows in our bronchoscopy suites, and we were having cellularity issues as well as fungal contaminants in our thrombin and cell clot blocks. Staff were constantly coming to us asking us, where are the cells in the cell block? There was a noodle when I brought the satellite to the lab and we were getting blocks like I have the picture here. Um, this is a thrombin cell clot block. The patient, it was a liver FNA and the patient had a history of breast cancer. We could not perform all the necessary ancillary testing on the cell block due to the limited cellularity. So we started reaching out to hospitals, people that we knew, gathering different protocols from them. And we tried many, many methods. We worked with histology and our prep personnel and honestly, just were not having luck with different methods. So it was around the same time that Hologic introduced us to the Cellient. And the Cellient is an automated cell block system that rapidly creates a paraffin embedded cell block. 
The system processes one cell block at a time and it uses a vacuum to deposit cells onto a filter and infiltrates the cells with reagents and paraffin. There are two ways that you can process a cell block on the cellient. One is to transfer cellular material directly from the thin prep preserve sit vial. And the second is a manual mode where you can place tissue fragments one millimeter or less directly on the filter. We had been using the thin prep um, system for our non-gens since before I arrived in 1997. So we had a lot of familiarity with, with the um, preserve set and the cellulite or the cytolite is what our specimens were already being collected in. So we thought, you know, this did have a lot of advantage for our laboratory and wanted to try it. Um, it did give consistent preparations in a much shorter amount of time. The alcohol fixation actually preserves the nucleic acids, which for us was a big help with molecular testing. The way the cell processes the cell, the cell block, there's also residual material, which we could use for ancillary tests. We currently have two regional sites that actually do not have histology on site. So this was a big advantage for them because they could process their cell blocks on site. We trained personnel to cut the cell blocks there and they stain them there instead of having to send the sample to main campus to be processed, have slides cut and stained and sent back to them. It decreased their turnaround time for their non-gens and it also helped our turnaround time at our main campus. So to process a cell block on the cellulite, you require a kit. Kits come with consum consumables to process 50 cell blocks. The kit components include three pipettes, a filter, a cellulite um, cassette, and then a pre-filled wax mold. Reagents that are used on the instrument include isopropyl alcohol, paraplast, and xylene. The preserve sit vial that is used to make the thin prep slide is also is what's used on the cellulite. If minimal sample is left after processing the thin prep slide, you can add three to five drops from the pellet to this vial so that you can make the cell block. So to get started, we properly label the block. We take this filter here and place it into the cassette. And then the filter assembly is loaded onto the cellulite right here. We then also load in the three pipettes and the preserve sit vial. And the picture on the right, we lock the arm in place. There's a mechanism behind this that is free that will come and pick up a pipette and then it takes sample and deposits it directly onto the filter. If we were going to process in the manual mode, we would place the sample directly onto the filter assembly before we lock the arm in place. When the cell block is on this part of the instrument, it takes about 30 to 35 minutes. Once the cell block has processed on that part of the instrument, we use free spray to remove the filter. And we have the cassette, which is on the left in this picture. That's the shape of the filter. The final step is now to embed the cell block as it looks on the right so that a slide can be cut and prepared. This is a picture of the cell block being completed on the finishing station. We melt the pre-filled wax mold in the embedding mold, place the cell block into it. And after about five to eight minutes, you have a cell block that's embedded and ready to be cut and, and the slides to be stained. So I would be lying if I told you we plugged this in and just started making cell blocks and had a ton of success. We had some challenges. It took some time for prep personnel to judge the amount of sample to use. If too much sample is placed in the preserve set vial or directly onto the filter, the filter will clog and the process needs started over. This results in a loss of the sample that's already been deposited into the filter. Also processing one a sample at a time is very challenging for a lab our size. We have a high volume of cell blocks and 
Um, one of the things that we did was we did have a second shift. So the instrument was running longer throughout the day. And then as I showed you in one of our pictures, purchasing multiple instruments helped us as well. Um, we, as Melissa mentioned, had to do a validation on our IHC stains because these cell blocks are alcohol fixed. So we were able to work with our IHC department to do that for our heavily used stains. And for a lot of labs, I think a big challenge is these instruments require space, they require capital money, and you do need to purchase that kit in order to process the cell blocks. So if this wasn't enough challenges, we had even more once the blocks were prepared on how to get them cut. Um, you know, from and cell clot, which we have been using, worked well to fit into histology's process. And because these are processed differently, they, they require histology to, to handle them separately. Um, this instrument uses paraplast paraffin, which cannot be substituted. And the histotechs tell me that this cuts differently than other paraffin. Um, also, because the system uses a vacuum to process, the cells are actually deposited in a way that's shaped like a contact lens. And this was something that um, we had a challenge with at first, because if you can imagine sectioning a contact, you see the picture on the left, you get this appearance of a rim. So the histotechs thought they weren't cutting far enough into the block, but there are cells deposited throughout each layer of the block. So they were cutting away a lot of the block. And when you get to the picture of on the right, this looks like the bottom of a contact lens. This here, it, you've almost cut through the block. So the one thing that we did, which really helped us, was the CAS not only came in and trained the cytology staff, as the cytotechs, the prep personnel, the pathologists, they also came and they helped train histology to cut the cell blocks. Once they did that, we had a lot of success with cellular blocks. The last thing that we worked on with histology is we now had this cell block that was ready to be cut. And we talked to them and we take cell blocks over to them every two hours throughout the day. They cut the blocks, stain the slides and bring them over to us. Um, our collaboration with histology really maximized us getting cell blocks the same day and is what helped us in the end to decrease turnaround time on some of our non-gen specimens. So many of you may be thinking, why did you really do this? Because it, it didn't seem like it was much easier than some of the other techniques. Um, you know, there were really two reasons. Um, one, this method gave us the most consistent, consistent and highest cellular yield of any method that we had tried. Um, also, this process doesn't use the entire sample and we had much more sample left over to work on molecular and ancillary testings. I have two quick patient cases that I'd like to show you just to help illustrate how we fit this into our process. Case one is a 53 year old male. He had a two centimeter lobulated right upper lobe nodule with enlarged right hilar and mediastinal lymph nodes. He had an EBIS FNA performed on the nodule and lymph nodes. And what we're looking at here is just rows um, from the nodule. At rows, we call this nodule positive for non-small cell carcinoma. These are just two different power views of the cell block from this case. You can see on the 10X view, there's many clusters of um, malignant cells. And the 20X view is just a little higher view. You can see the nuclear detail. So what we do for our non-small cell protocol at Cleveland Clinic is at the time of rows, if they are suspicious or we call it positive for non-small cell, additional passes are collected. The bronchoscopist will often take up to four additional passes at the time. Um, we bring the sample back to the lab, process a thin break, thin prep and cell block from the sample and hold the residual pellet for two weeks. IHC stains are performed on the salient cell block. We do one marker for adenocarcinoma, which is typically TTF1, and one marker for squamous cell carcinoma, which is typically P40. If we favor squamous cell carcinoma, PDL1 is performed, and if we favor adenocarcinoma, we send the residual pellet to the molecular lab for next-gen sequencing. 
and elk is performed on the thin prep slide that we prepare as part of the case. For this patient, we did our IHC and we had a positive TTF1 and a negative P40. So we sent the residual pellet for next gen sequencing and the thin prep slide for elk testing. Case two is a 68 year old male. He's a non smoker, has a base of the tongue lesion and bilateral neck lymphadenopathy. Um, we received FNA of the lymph node from his left neck left neck, and um, we were not on site for this FNA. I have a 2x power of the cell block because I think if you look, you can appreciate the multiple tissue fragments. This was a very cellular cell block. And on 20x, I think you can all appreciate this is squamous cell carcinoma. We did perform P16 on this, which we um, resulted as inconclusive with weekly positive staining. We took that pellet in the remaining fluid and we sent it for HPV testing. And the patient's HPV testing was positive, which gives him a better prognosis and helps direct their treatment. I would encourage everyone, and I think Donna and Melissa has, have said the same message, try different cell block methods, see what's most useful to your laboratory. Everyone has different levels of resources. And I think it's important to utilize the methods that really highlight the benefit cytology has to aid in our patients' personalized treatment. Um, and I just want to, again, say thank you. Here's my contact information, and I would be happy to answer any questions that aren't brought up today or at any time. So you can reach out to me if you have questions. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I would like to take this moment to introduce Dr. Vora from the University of California, San Francisco. Um, let me share. Um, can you see my screen? Your PowerPoint is not up in presentation. Could you remind me one more time what to click to go to the presentation mode? Maybe at the very bottom of the uh, screen in your Where PowerPoint, slide show. the presentation or the slideshow. Across the top is the slideshow. Slideshow, yeah. Oh, yes, yeah. You can click the slideshow. Yep. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Very good. Hello, everybody. This is Poonam Vora. I would like to thank Clinical Practice Committee for giving me this opportunity. And I'm going to talk about two methods. One is Claudian back technique and other one is agar gel method. We use this in different campuses. So starting with Claudian back technique, uh, the first step is to fix the aspirate, FNA aspirate in formalin um, material. And then uh, use colloidian. And colloidian is a commercially available liquid polymer. And basically, we make uh, prepare the colloidian bags first. For this, pour colloidian reagent into these glassed test tubes and make sure to fill it to the top. And then uh, by using two glass test tubes, uh, we pour the colloidian back and forth multiple times while gently rotating the tubes. And this is a very important step uh, to ensure that there is an even coating of the colloidian inside the tube. And uh, some labs I have seen, instead of doing multiple back and forth, they just keep the colloidian reagent in the tube for one hour. Uh, so making cell blocks at the right thickness is very important because um, it is beneficial to nearly eliminate 
the number of bags which tear when you take them out from the tube. After uh, coating the tube, the chlorodyne uh, reagent is uh, put back into the chlorodyne uh, uh, reagent bottle. And then the tubes are placed upside down in the test tube rack for 10 to 15 minutes to dry. It is, if the bag is not sufficiently dry, the tube will uh, uh, appear opaque and cannot be used. And uh, when the bag is sufficiently dry, you'll see that the material is started separating from the glass tubes. So ensure that it's dried completely. And after that, we fill the tubes with distilled water and cover with a parafilm. Some labs also use a tap water instead of distilled water. And then um, we discard the distilled water before pipetting out uh, the formalin fixed specimen into this uh, chloridian uh, bag tube, which is which has two patient identifiers. And if you're using in case unfixed uh, fresh specimen, so that we what we do after making our cytology smears, whatever the remaining pellet is there, we put it in buffered formalin, and then of course let it sit for one hour after covering it with paraffin. And then concentrate the specimen by centrifugation at 2500 RPM for 10 minutes. Another uh, thing we can do if the specimen is colorless, add one drop of hematoxylin into the colloidian bag tube, tube to make it more visible. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, decant the supernatant. And now here, the important thing is not to decant all of the supernatant because a little bit of supernatant has to be left behind. It helps to hold the pellet in place. Otherwise, the pellet will uh, break. And then gently remove the bag from the test tube with the help of forceps. You can loosen the bag and then gently pull it out, as you can see in this image. And then lay uh, the bag on the tissue paper and tie with a cotton string just above the pellet. This is followed by trimming the bag um, and the string, extra string material and the bag above the pellet, as you can see that. And then it is wrapped in the tissue paper um, and folded it, care, folded carefully and put it in the labeled cassette, which goes into formalin container. Uh, recently, um, uh, one of our colleagues at UCSF uh, utilized uh, the study to show the success of chloridian bag in collaboration with MGH. And basically in this paper, they um, compared three techniques, saline, plasma thrombin, histogel, and chloridian bag. And uh, with various examples, I'm going to show how successful was the chloridian bag technique. As in this example, uh, numerous tissue fragments, almost they look like corelets, small core fragments with greater cellularity, preservation, and also great architecture for squamous cell carcinoma. This is another example of diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, again showing greater higher cellularity as it traps not only bigger fragments, but also single cells in the background, which is very helpful for the diagnosis. Another example of pancreatic solid pseudopapillary tumor demonstrating beautiful fibrovascular cores lined by cuboidal cells with minimum, minimal destruction of the architecture here. So overall, colloidin back techniques have several advantages, uh, including better preservation and superior architecture, more cellularity, and it has shown um, in various publications that um, using chloridin bags not only traps free floating single cells, but also concentrate bigger fragments. And that helps, especially in uh, specimens with low volume or low cellularity specimens. It is compatible for immunohistochemistry. And also because of greater cellularity, they have higher DNA recovery uh, rate for molecular testing. Uh, like everything comes with benefits, also comes with limitations. 
Um, so cloyden bag technique can be cumbersome and time consuming, but uh, the remedial measures for that is the good point is that we can make cloyden line seal test tubes filled with distilled water and keep it for some time, like one to two weeks. So that way you can make make these cloyden bag tubes in bulk and save it for the later use instead of making them one by one. And also, as um, all of you may know, that colloidian solution is suspended in ether-based solvent. So safety is very important here. And they should always be used under lamellar, lamellar flow hood um, whenever we are making these bags. And also, evaporation of ether solvent can lead to peroxidized, peroxidase formation, which is flammable. So it is recommended to store these in small aliquots in a flame-proof cabinets. Main practical limitation is breaking of cloidin bag. And as I mentioned before, the key is to have the right thickness, maybe pouring uh, the cloidin between two test tubes multiple times or make, keeping the bag um, on the side with the cloidin solution for an hour or so. It could be te technically challenging, especially when you're removing the bag, it may break. So proper training can overcome uh, that challenge. If for more information, there's a YouTube video by one of our um, colleagues at UCSF, which you can uh, easily see on, this is the link for the video. Now moving on to another technique, agar gel, which we use in other campus. And basically for this, we prepare agar medium first by suspending agarose powder in distilled water in these 15 ml conical centrifuge tubes. And then placing this agar on a heating block so that agar is completely liquid, which is again very important. And then we do all these steps, starting with centrifugation for five minutes and then decant the supernatant fluid. And again, if the if the material is scant or colorless, adding one drop of hematoxin is helpful. The next step is very important where we add equal amount of warm agar in formalin pellet. And then again, we mix it, centrifuge it and solidify it or chill it at four degrees centigrade for 15 minutes. And then we move the pellet out and uh, slice uh, for two to four millimeter thick sections before putting them into labeled cassettes. Uh, agar gel has shown a good cell preservation compatible for both immunohistochemistry and molecular testing. And also it's versatile. It can be used for specimens fixed in different things. I'm going to talk a little bit about limitations of agar gel. If there is too little agar, it will fail to congeal the cells. Or if there's too much, it may tend to uh, decrease, uh, dilute the specimen and decrease cellularity. So here, the key thing is to add equal amount of agar based on the pellet size and also making sure that there's optimal liquefaction of agar gel. Sometimes agar gel our, uh, method is challenging when the specimens are bloody. So in these cases, we tend to divide the specimen into two different um, and try to make two different cell blocks instead of one diluted cell block. And then molten agar can also lead to heat-induced artifacts in cells, which we should be aware of. Um, and other, some studies have shown poor cell block adequacy in samples with low cell counts. For this, what we try to do is we try to increase our fixation time in formalin, and that I have seen has helped um, with increase, for increasing the cellularity of the specimen. So with agar cell block, we, you, we saw the utility of cell blocks. We tried to see the utility of cell blocks in urine cytology. And as you know, routine use of cell blocks has not been reported in urine cytology much. In this study, what we did was we prepared a cell block in 36 cases where the original diagnosis was uh, inconclusive, whether it was not a definite diagnosis of low grade or atypical. And also we made when the um, cystoscopic finding showed some lesion or a mass. So basically our study showed that cell block contributed to a definite diagnosis in 67% of our cases in urine cytology. And these were different cases 
I'll show you some of them via these examples. For example, uh, this is a, a smear of urine cytology where you see a cluster with slight high NC ratio, but the contributory cell block provided beautiful diagnostic architectural features um, of umbrella cells overlying these benign clusters of urothelial cells, making diagnosis of negative or high grade easy. Another example of these crowded groups, big groups of uh, urothelial cells, and our cell block showed beautiful fibrovascular cores, making a definite diagnosis of low-grade urothelial neoplasia. Another example where cells look atypical with high NC ratio and hyperchromatism, but cell block uh, further helped uh, supported our diagnosis of high grade by showing this kind of architectural disorganization and also cytological atypia, confirming our diagnosis. This is an example where you can see atypical cells with cretinizing um, cytoplasm. And as you can see in the cell block, there is a frank squamous cell carcinoma or carcinoma with squamous cell features uh, by showing classic retinization and also marked cytological atypia. Another use of uh, cell block was when we um, used in the case of prostate cancer, um, as you can see here, prominent nucleoli in these cells, but cell block showed beautiful architecture of prostate adenocarcinoma, which was further confirmed by immunohistochemical stain. So basically with this paper uh, and with agrigel technique, we um, recommend using a cell block in urine cytology when there is a papillary lesion or a mass, or when the cytology is unequivocal, uh, equivocal, and also in cases of when there is non-urothelial or metastatic malignancy. Before um, ending my presentation, I just wanted to go over one more thing quickly. Uh, various ways where we can improve the cell block even before starting uh, the process of making a cell block. So we can do um, by providing rapid on-site evaluation and triaging a cell block accordingly, maybe making more dedicated passes for the cell block. And also separating diagnostic FNA passes from non-diagnostic passes. And uh, sometimes scrap, scraping or rinsing material from the slide into the formalin container is also helpful. But recently we are using this very easy and a quick method in our uh, FNA samples. And again, this video is by Dr. Balasanian available on CAP website. How to maximize the yield of single FNA. So very quick, quick and simple procedure after FNA aspiration, when you see material both in the hub of the needle and the syringe, um, and especially it works very well with the bloody specimens. What you do is you detach the needle from the syringe and keep the syringe on the side. Um, basically, this method utilizes natural clotting ability of the blood to increase cellularity of the cell block. And, uh, it, and maybe the fibrin is the one which, use, uh, which acts as a mesh to trap these free floating cells and increases the cellularity of the cell blocks. And in the meantime, while the syringe is sitting on the side, we use another syringe um, where we attach a needle and make smears. And after the smears are made, then we take this uh, syringe, which was put aside and rinse it into the formalin container and gives a good thick uh, material going into the cell block. So you can try using this in your lab. Thank you very much. And uh, I will... Uh, forward this to Donna. Hey, I'll ask all the panelists to come back on for questions. We do have a number of questions for this afternoon. Uh, we'll wait for Dawn to come back on. There she is. Okay. So uh, the first question was, uh, do the presenters have any experience with the nano next gel cell blocking technique? I'll just start. Uh, I do not have any experience with that technique. Not me either. I no. do not either. Sorry about that. You'll have to refer to the manufacturer, I guess, um, or we could put it out there to see if anyone else has. 
And a question for Melissa about where can you find the mold? Okay, so Fisher Scientific has molds, Cardinal has molds. If you put in their um, disposable base molds, you will find it in their catalog. They're pretty inexpensive. The last time I bought them, it was about $45 for, it's either a hundred or a thousand, I can't remember, but it's pennies compared to bringing patients back for other biopsies. And there was another question uh, specifically for you, Melissa. When you changed from RPMI, how are you handling specimens for flow cytometry? Okay, so we still do have a separate collection for flow cytometry that uses our PMI. Don't get me wrong. It's just that when we go in and we think that we're dealing with an epithelial malignancy, we don't really go for the RPMI. If we think that there's a possibility that we have, you know, we're not sure if it's epithelial versus a hematologic, we'll collect both and be on the safe side. And you can still get good cell blocks out of RPMI, but they are superior with the cytorich red. Okay, and one specifically for you, Dawn, uh, do you reflexively perform P40 and TTF1 on all non-small cell carcinoma cases or just cases which are not obviously, uh, I mean, squamous cell or adenocarcinoma based on the cytomorph? It's definitely not 100% of them that we do it on. The ones that we're confident in, you know, a squamous cell or adenocarcinoma, we definitely will not do it. But I think it helps guide us into the right testing for the patient and uh, what samples we're sending on. So it, it's done in quite a few of them, but if there's an obvious squamous cell, we won't do it. Okay. And I guess this question to be either for Melissa or, or Dr. Bora, um, how much gel do you usually put into each cell block mold or cell block? Okay, so for cell gel, when we first developed the technique, we would actually fill the mold up to the top. And we were doing that for a very specific purpose because we were trying to figure out how many sections can we get out of this block? You know, is the end of it as good as the beginning? Um, and trying to pre present a uh, consistent product for the histotex. We have figured out lately, though, that you're diluting the specimen more when you do that. So um, as we've come up with this 10 by 10 mold, um, we maybe are putting less in there than we used to. So to fill something up to the top after our actual specimen went in the mold, I would say there's probably about 10 more drops in there to fill up the mold. It's not necessary, it's just how do you want to handle that specimen. And for chloridin packs, you fill the tube uh, with the chloridin reagent and then you do back and forth multiple times for the even coating. And for agar gel technique, we put equal amount of agar into, depending on what the size of a pellet is. Okay. Uh, there was I guess a comment and a question. I remember some pushback, some pushback on the cost of histogel originally. Um, ideas on cost for these various methods. Uh, quality should come first. So, do you guys have any idea what the cost of of your specific methods are? Uh, I haven't figured it out per specimen. I do know what all of the raw material cost is. Um, and I tend to buy histogel by the case uh, to try to get a little bit cheaper. It's definitely not as cheap if you buy it a box at a time, which is 12 tubes. We'll go through 12 tubes in a few days. Um, but you can get 30 specimens out of a tube of histogel. So if you can kind of combine that math, you might be able to, that is the most expensive part of this of this technique is the histogel. The rest of it is a pittance. For colloidin bag, I have recently seen uh, one publication in 2020 actually, and they compared not only the embedding, ease of embedding and other factors, but also cost uh, with, and they compared it with histogel. So it was marginally more than histogel, like 24 or 25 cent difference, but quality as per that paper, colloidin bags were much better. 
I I did look on Hologic's website because the instruments used to be listed in the cost. Um, I don't see that listed anymore, so I'm not sure. It's probably best to talk to your um, Hologic sales rep to get the the cost of the kit and the um, the instrument for the for that. Okay, I hope that answers um, that person's question. The, there was a question on, could the presenters tell us how they validated, validated IHC on cell blocks? I think that's a whole other session, if everybody agrees. Huh? Yes. That would yeah. take us too much time to go into that. Um, what we kind of did is, because we knew it was going to be very intense, is we got the list of our top five and we said, we need you to work on these first. And we helped, you know, by giving them cell blocks that they could work with and, and those kind of things. So I think it was definitely, um, and I, you know, it's outside my expertise too. I think our IHC uh, manager would be a better person to talk about that, but it's, we started as small as we could, so it didn't seem so onerous to them, and then just kept adding them, and we're still adding, you know, validations today. I think, if you remember that the uh, pathology is your gold standard, that if you can um, do it at the surgical pathology bench on tumor specimens, it, it can work really well um, in whatever media that you're using. But if anything is different than the formal infestation, obviously validation has to take place. Um, there was one comment, good to see success with cellians. Uh, we could never get our histotex to overface the cell blocks. Very upsetting. Yeah. Let me see if there's any more questions. I noticed yeah. one question asked about molecular testing. Um, we were doing molecular testing, uh, fish testing off of some of the salient cell blocks. It uses eosin as a stain um, so they can, the histotex can see when they're facing into the block. That is one thing we modified. Um, it's kind of off label, but we used eosin blue instead, just because, or not eosin blue. <laughs> we used another stain where, yeah, thank you. Um, because of the autofluorescence with the, um, the eosin. So the one thing with the salient is you can't introduce water to it. So you need to mix it with 100% um, alcohol. That was the only time we had an issue if we didn't mix the stain properly on the, the instrument. There's a number of additional questions that I am just going to refer those um, after to the actual participants in this series today, um, I would like to thank everyone for the presentations of the panelists today. And just as everyone has said, try different methods. Um, see what works best for your laboratory to get the best cell block preparation for you um, when you're looking at costs and uh, patient care. And I'd like to thank everybody again for their presentations. Really appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely.